Welcome, everyone. Uh, as Raj said, uh, really, real pleasure to host you all here for this uh, first event. Um, and I'm especially pleased because um, Shonika Rishi is with us here this evening. Um, I'll give you the um, personal introduction first, and then I'll go into list his uh, many accolades. But um, when we started Avanti, uh, when we were, or before we even started Avanti, when we were thinking about starting Avanti, um, we reached out to a small number of individuals um, from whom we sought advice and guidance in terms of what um, a, a, an education system based on Hindu values might look like. And um, Shonika Rishi uh, was one of those people who was an advisor to us then um, and has continued to be in terms of his um, input and uh, particularly in his role as um, the director of the Oxford Centre for Hindu Studies. So um, really grateful, Shonika, for you being here this evening. Um, and now I'm going to read out something from uh, a bit more formal. So he is the founder and director of the Oxford Centre for Hindu Studies, which was founded in 1997 as the world's first academy of its kind for the study of Hindu culture. The centre is developing a new multidisciplinary approach to Hindu studies that creates a discourse between Indian and Western traditions of scholarship as peers. The approach is unique in addressing Indian thought and culture on its own terms. Shonika is a lecturer, a broadcaster, and Hindu chaplain to Oxford University. His interests include education, comparative theology, communication, and leadership. He is a member of the Commission on Religion and Belief in British Public Life, convened in 2013 by the Wolf Institute, Cambridge. And in 2013, the Indian government appointed him to sit on the International Advisory Council of the Oroville Foundation. So um, we have a real expert with us tonight, um, and uh, we're going to be asking some uh, reasonably challenging questions, which uh, I know he's um, more than capable of responding to. So with that, um, we will begin. So we'll start softly. <laughs> and uh, the first question is really, if you can just talk us through what was your thinking and um, behind setting up the Oxford Centre? What, what, was, what was it that you were seeking to achieve? The Oxford Centre, we, we realised that there, there wasn't an academic centre for Hindu studies anywhere in the world. And this was the late 20th century. Uh, that was a bit shocking because there are many centers for Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, Judaism, and they're very well funded by their communities and different states, obviously, as well. Um, so that was quite jarring in a sense. And an opportunity opened up in Oxford. A door opened and uh, we just said, okay, let's... Let's do this. Uh, not that we had done anything like that before. In actual fact, um, I've never myself been to university. I joined an ashram at the age of 18 and uh, came out 13 years later, which would have been exactly the time it would have taken to get an undergraduate, master's and PhD. And I had nothing <laughs> except my bead bag, Bhagavad Gita. Um, but, but it was just too good an opportunity to miss. And Oxford was open. and. Uh, the world was open to it. We had the support of many scholars, and that's, that's how it became uh, so successful. And the idea of the center really was to explore Hinduism as we think we know it um, in all its facets. So it's very multidisciplinary. It's not just about religion. It's about philosophy. It's about sociology. It's about history. It's about art, architecture. You, you know, it's, it's very, it has to be broad because Hinduism is actually broad. It's a, it's, no one has ever defined Hinduism, so and we weren't going to do it either. So, so we could study anything, but it was also about making it accessible to a global audience, and and it's not accessible to a global audience. In actual fact, anyone who's been to school and tried to study Hinduism at GCSE levels, when the teacher starts telling you about festivals that you already celebrate, you kind of don't relate to it. You know, it's it's, it's difficult. And uh, it's very difficult trying to explain to your friends in college about Ganesh and his best friend, the rat. And uh, how, do you, how do you explain that? You know, so it's, how do you bring this culture into the mainstream here? It's eminently doable. Mm -hmm. and, it's eminent, and it's very important to do it because it has so much to offer globally. So it was to make it accessible, to explore it, uh, to publish it, and... Um, to create conversation about it. Um, so it's not only academic, which the center is academic, being in Oxford, but it's also about helping the communities understand how to communicate themselves 
bringing education. We, we call it cradle to higher education. So for us, Avanti is part of our strategy. Yeah, well, <laughs> well on that, um, when, when Shenik and I first spoke, um, he'd said to me that, you know, part of the, the, the role of the OCHS and the benefit um, and when Avanti would really reach its fruition, I don't know if you remember the conversation, but it was the when, um, uh, you know, we would have PhDs coming from the Oxford Centre coming in to teach uh, Avanti. And I said to him, well, maybe Avanti will be bringing students to you to turn into PhDs. So we've sent, we've sent a couple to Oxford now, but we're yes, waiting for we the we yeah. We have two. <laughs> two. Yeah. It's a start. We're, wa we're <laughs> waiting for the PhDs to come back into Avanti though. <laughs> but you mentioned GCS. I mean, you, you know, we have, we're having a current issue. Like, so when we, when we started Avanti and when we were, you know, began to set up and look at the GCSE curriculum on Hinduism, mm. um, and it was, it was shocking. It was shocking at how, poorly constructed it was, mm. how myopic it was, how informed by a colonial perspective it was. Um, and, uh, you know, their obsession with the caste system or their obsession with whatever else that they think is important for kids to learn about that mm. really doesn't affect them in this country. Um, so we had to do a lot of work with um, the Department for Education, with Ofqual to reposition the GCSE in Hinduism to make it more reflective um, of ground reality. Um, and we've even got a current a dispute with um, the Cambridge International Exams on the Hinduism A level mm. um, because of their very narrow application of themes and uh, philosophy within Hinduism. So that's a really interesting mm. kind of point there. And, and the importance of the role of OCHS in being able to um, convey a genuine and authentic position on these matters. Yeah. So absolutely. And it's, it's the more students we get, the more we can do that work. The more, the more yeah. we qualify people, they don't have to stay in Oxford. They just have to become educated and get out there and get jobs and then begin to question these things themselves. And it's not, it's not belligerently questioning. It's not questioning you, the oppressors, and we are, you know, the, and all that kind of yeah. stuff. That's not the issue. The issue is opening a, a, a productive conversation and just and questioning said, Look, this is what we're teaching. Is this the best we can do? And that's just an intelligent question. And, uh, but then you have the capacity to do something about it. Um, so that's, that's kind of why, why we exist. Yeah, no, fantastic. Thanks for that intro. Um, so this evening's uh, conversation um, titled, um, you know, Are We Better Off Without Religion? So you know, obviously there's lots of conversation. It has been centuries, I guess, and never stopped. Um, but this question around the advantages and disadvantage of religion. So I think... Um, you know, many would argue this point that we are better off without religion. Mm. So what would your initial response to that be? How would, you, how would you come at that question? I'd have to ask, are we better off without the Declaration of Human Rights, which was uh, prompted in the UN by religious people? The UN didn't want to do it, but it was religious people insisted after World War II that unless you have this, then this could happen again. Uh, and now it is the most significant thing that the UN has done. Are we better off without um, the Queen of England, who just passed away, whose whole life of duty, I mean, we, we've been hearing about it, her, her exemplary life of duty and service and dedication is all based on her prayer life, which she said herself, on her, her devotion to Christianity and prayer and her relationship with God. And she was a broad-minded lady. She was uh, supportive of all faiths, but this was her personal conviction and her personal principle. And this is what inspired her. So this 70 years of stability and example, and people of all faiths and none in every culture are lauding her for her leadership. It's like a, a master class in leadership without doubt. And this is because of her religious conviction. Are, are we better off without that? Are we better off without yoga, without mindfulness that comes from Indian meditation techniques? So, you know, there, and I could go on. Are we better off yeah. without the NHS? Are we better off without 64% of the world's schools or religious schools? Well, of course, we're sitting in one at the moment. But so religion has had a huge influence on everything we do. And it's been for thousands of years. So for us to even think are we better off without religion would be a Rather impudent question, I, I would imagine. Art, architecture, music, dance, everything we touch 
has been developed science. The first scientists were all religious people. So, so we, we take something and we sanitize it and we think we take the religion out of it. It doesn't mean that we've done that in any significant form. But I think the most important thing is the Pew Charitable Trust did a, a huge global survey. And because this discussion has been going on for some time, you know, are we better off without religion? And are people not just fed up of it and moving on and all that stuff? But 84% of the world population are attached to one of the more significant religions. That's 84%. So who is it that's having this conversation? Because they're not winning. You know, people are interested in the bigger issues of life. And they are interested in happiness and love and tolerance and compassion and humility. And, and these, are, these are the big issues of people's lives. Yeah. It's, not, it's not whatever else we throw in front of them. The American Constitution says um, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So no matter what constitution we have in the world, we quote the American Constitution, and maybe because of Hollywood, I don't know. But, but that's the one that we all, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But our pursuit of happiness is what exactly? And, and how are we defining that? The American Constitution doesn't define it. So, so people want it defined. They want to discuss it. They want to open it up. And we can call that religion. Uh, and we, we can call it an awful lot of things. But is there a need for that? There's, there always has been an absolute need for that in, in everyone's life to feel fulfilled and satisfied in their hearts. And it's not a head thing as much. It's also the heart. It's both things together. And uh, if we just cut out the heart thing as being somehow irrelevant or superficial or superstitious or too intuitive, uh, we're cutting out part of, of the bigger picture. Yeah. And this is very much the bigger picture. Yeah. But you, I mean, so I think the, 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 the common reply to or retort to that might be that um, there is, you know, there, there, there's a de facto or a kind of default reliance on religion, the 84% of the world who mm -hmm. may or may not follow. And on an individual basis, the effect that religion may have in terms of psychological or emotional support, whatever that might offer. Mm -hmm. But in terms of societal and kind of at a level of, um, a level of manipulation, a level of political um, manipulation, a level, you know, all of these things where religion is used as a mechanism to do yeah. bad. And, and, um, and the efficiency through which we can gain the benefits that we gain, whether they are material benefits or emotional benefits, that those benefits may be better. So in the early stages of human development, um, reliance on something simple like religion, now in the modern world, are we not better off taking away that element which is subject to such corruption in a way that science and other things are not? And, and, and by that I mean, you see, with religion, part of the kind of criticism around religion mm. is that you have almost like an unassailable authority. Yeah. Right. And that, that, as soon as you have an unassailable authority, you have a problem because... Do, do you not think that science these days has an unassailable authority? Yeah, sure. So I right. think... So, so then it's just supplanted religion and created a different problem. No, but the, 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 I think that I would say the difference is that with science, um, you can always... Somebody can always challenge. Well, someone can always challenge religion. But not a, not a follower of religion. In terms of, uh, you know, Martin, scripture, you can't challenge scripture. Martin Luther did a good job. But not of scripture. He's challenging the application. Well, he did. He, he, he challenged the interpretation of scripture. Right. The, the conversation has always been going on. Right. And people have always been coming together and breaking apart. And Hinduism, uh, particularly, is full of that. There's, the whole development of Hinduism is about a guru and he has disciples, and then his disciples go off and make disciples. And there isn't really an institutional element. So you can't point to the institution. There's the starting point. No one, no one has any idea where that was or which book. There's so many books. You come into our library, and there are walls of books that are scripture. It's not one book. It's many, many books. Which one are you going to focus on? You have to decide that for yourself. So it's up to every individual to suss this out. This is how it's always been. So to limit it down to something very small would be re retrograde. So to say that we've developed and we've left the simple behind, when did religion become simple? 
But when when is religion not be the basis of philosophical thinking, theological thinking, you know, the development of so many subjects that we study in university? In actual fact, religion is the basis of universities. The, the um, black robes we wear, you know, uh, when you get your degree and you wear your black black robes, you will be wearing a black robe. Uh, so uh, these are Islamic. These are from Islamic scholars. So the the Christians were learning from. Uh, Islam, and not quite giving them the credit they needed, but they realized that the Islamic scholars wore black, so their fashion choice was, again, black robes, and that, that gave them status, because the Islamic scholars at that time were these scholars. They were the ones who actually had the Greek and Roman texts and had preserved them and were interpreting them. Very interesting. You know, so they, the Christians had to catch up, and uh, so religion has been the basis of our whole university system. So, so to think that, you know, so religion is retrograde in some way, I, I don't see it. And has kind of materialism taken over or something? Only if you want to be materialistic. Personally, I don't. So I'm not very interested. So I think science is very important. And I think religion is very important. And I think there are people on the planet who are going to take advantage of these things and economics and politics and football, and financial controls, and all kinds of stuff uh, for their own advantage because they're greedy people, because they're angry people, because they're lusting after power. I, I, I think that's the problem. And I don't think religion is the problem. I think religion is just a thing that people are going to use and interpret in their own way. And someone's going to bump into religion and say, this is what it means. It means I'm right. <laughs> and run off into the far distance and beat everyone else over the head and insist that I'm right, so you have to do what I do because I'm right. So I'm Shonika. What's your name? You're, not, you're wrong because you're not Shonika. See? But so the Indian intellectual process has always been different. It's been, I'm Shonika. You don't know. What do you do? Dinesh? So I'm interested. Here's a different person with a different perspective. Maybe their perspective can inform my perspective rather than beat them into the ground to insist that they follow my perspective. Yeah. So there are different ways of approaching it. So that way I'm interested in. I find people with that kind of maturity in every religion in the world. I also find people who want to bash you over the head with some scripture or other in every religion in the world. So it's not religion is the problem. We're the problem. And it's, we're bringing our greed and our anger to it and our, our, those qualities. Dealing with those qualities globally is going to be the issue. It is the issue. It always has been the issue. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I want to go into a bit about interfaith because you touched upon that just there in terms of the mechanism on the, the, the way in which we can engage in interfaith. But before we do that, um, you, you, you know, the, you made the point around um, religion's not the problem, we're the problem um, in terms of how we're misusing. And, and I guess the... What I was trying to get to about this point around religion incorporating some kind of unassailable authority in scripture, because you can then get the book bashers yeah. who, who, who will use that in that way, um, is that uh, the fact that we are susceptible as human beings to that type of, is, is, is exactly why many people feel we are better off without religion, because to have something which is so dangerous um, in a way where you would you know, we, we don't have, well, at least in some places, not all drugs are legal because, because of that reason that people can't be trusted to use it in the way that it's. So aside from the fact of whether God exists or not, yeah. just the function of religion and its effect on society yeah. and on individual psychology. Yeah, I, see, I don't see it. I don't see it statistically. So I, I don't see that these thousands of years of religion have led us down a garden path that is full of thorns. I, I don't. I just don't see it. I see religious people manifesting all over the world in many different guises, and they've been tremendous inspirations for millions of people. So Jesus appeared two thousand years ago, and there are over two billion Christians on the planet now. How influential is that? Is it a good influence? Well, I, for me, for the vast majority, these people are trying to be good, and, and there's always a minority, and it's always a minority statistically. So most people want to be good and they have difficulty with it. And, you know, it's a struggle. And everyone puts their hand up and say, yes, I'd like to be good, but I kind of don't succeed on a daily basis. 
but even the honest attempt is is better than not. And what's given them that impetus is their spirituality and the stories of other people's spirituality and examples of people that they know and examples of good work. That's that's what keeps them going. And those narratives, you find them in religion more than you find them anywhere else. So for a lot of people, religion is important. It's not the opiate of the people that Marx was talking about. Yes, people can use religion like that, and maybe they use religion in Europe like that at different times, but there's a whole world out there. You know, China, highly developed. India, more developed practically than anywhere else when it comes to religion. So from the time of Pythagoras, people have been talking about India and its pluralism. The, the world can't get its head around pluralism. You know, it, it's always me and you, you must be wrong, rather than me and you together. India has this other way that, you know, it's Jews can go there and not get persecuted. How did it happen? It didn't happen anywhere else. So there's, there's, a, there's a thinking, there's a philosophical perspective that we're missing because we don't know what it is because we haven't studied it. As I said, we're the first academic center for Hindu studies in the world. There are two places on the planet in the Western world that study Indian philosophy, University of Hawaii, and now with us, the University of Oxford. So, and that's it. You know, and in India, we did an audit of all the universities in India who, who do philosophy. 80% of the philosophy is Western philosophy, and the 20% is poor Indian philosophy. So nobody's studying this. Nobody's looking at the ways of thinking that are different and why they're different and what they have to offer the world. Mm. So unless we start having a proper global conversation, uh, I, I don't think religion is the issue. Education is the issue. You know, lack of education. And if you educate people to, to ask questions, to, be, to critically analyze, and some religions don't like that, but Indian religions do, they ask you for that. The, the Bhagavad Gita Krishna says to Arjuna, you know, just approach a spiritual master and ask him questions. And all the Upanishads is about, um, uh, we'll look at the Rooney and his son, Shwetiketu, and his son is a, if you read that text, this is written thousands of years ago, his son is an obstreperous teenage brat. He comes back from, from university, the Gurukul, and his father asks him, what, do you, what did you learn about such and such? And he said, oh, oh, I, I, I didn't learn much about that, which means he failed. You know? And, and the, father, the father just starts to very patiently help him understand some points. And he's so streperous, he, he argues at every turn. And you can just, any modern teenager I've met with their iPhone, as they're, they're asking a question, you go, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, same. <laughs> it's just, it's, the times haven't changed. So education is definitely the key. There's no doubt about that. It's not, religion isn't a problem in that sense. Our lack of capacity to question and understand or thinking that we shouldn't, that, that's, a, that's ridiculous. So people should know that that's ridiculous. And that's not a modern idea of the Enlightenment. That's just always been there in, in, in Indian intellectual culture, in Chinese intellectual culture. Let's have a global conversation about this, which we're not having. We're having a, 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 a European-centered conversation. They're coming to us saying, you know, Here's the way to think intellectually, and here are the rules, and here are the ground rules. Well, who wrote the ground rules? Hang on a minute. Are we having a dialogue? Or are we just having, you're just telling us? So a dialogue means two parties, and they're peers. And they're given parity of esteem. They respect each other, which means both sides have to write the rules of dialogue. And that's not happening. So, so that, that's, what's, that's what's needed, yeah. so we can have a proper conversation. And just one other thing yeah. is, of the 15 major languages in India, there isn't a single word for religion. And the same in China. So this whole discussion on religion is also a bit of a problem. And I find when we talk about God and all these things, we use Western terms, but with the Western limitations, because we're using English, and with the limitations of that language, and the limitations of the philosophical assumptions inherent in that language. And I've the last number of years now, I've been going to funerals all over the place in the Lohana community, the Patel community, the Shah community, and some priest is up there and he says, blah, 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 rest in peace. And I think, what? Rest in peace is, is a totally Christian idea. So this, this Hindu or Jain person is lying there about to be cremated. Where's the resting in peace thing going on? And they're getting born somewhere, a wailing infant. There's no resting in peace. Their mother isn't resting in peace. She's trying to push it out, you know? It's a, you know, this, 
well, have we thought this through? You know, we, we come out, we just trot out this stuff uncritically. And that's not, that's not healthy for any culture. The culture has to understand itself and be able in modern context and modern languages to be able to articulate itself, but introduce words that can't be translated and help people understand what this concept means in the indigenous understanding so that it can be a global offering. And, and because of our la lack of intellectual capacity, we're not doing that yet. And that's on us. That's, you know, and, I'm, and it's not an Indian thing. It's a, it's a Hindu thing. I'm, I'm not Indian. <laughs> So, um, uh, I think that, that there, I'll, I'll leave the questions to the audience when we come onto this later about, you know, and, and you can, you probably have a response to this already, but I'm um, just to seed it. Um, you know, there, there are many things in scripture, which in today's world, we would look upon and say, why is that in scripture? Mm -hmm. Um, and things that have you know, either violence or slavery, so many things, gender, whatever, um, that, that, that we would look upon today and say, that doesn't, that doesn't look right, feel right, smell right. Mm. Um, and, and how is that then um, incorporated within the view of a religious person who then, you know, because sometimes we think about the book basher as being wrong, but the book basher may be right mm. in the sense that that's what the book's telling them to do. Mm. So. Um, if that's the case, then um, religion has a lot to answer for in, in, from the perspective of uh, inciting um, either hatred or violence. Mm. Um, and not, in a, not from the perspective of misinterpretation, because I think I fully agree with that point that, mm. you, know, if it, it, you know, if it's a case of misinterpretation, I think you can, you can argue that. But where it is very explicit, mm -hmm. um, and I'm across religions, yeah. um, then... You know, how does one, how does, how does one respond to that in, in, in the defense of religion and, and those types of passages? Yeah. Again, it's a question of, of, um, of education and it's a question of dialogue among religions and among people who aren't religious so that we can open up the conversation so people can say, I've been reading your, your text and I have a problem with that. Can we talk about it? And then sit down with that person and read the text with them, and see it through their eyes. And you, you might find there's a completely different meaning. And that, so that's, one person is committed to peace because of the Bhagavad Gita. Another person, because of the Bhagavad Gita, is committed to war. Why? What well, happens on the battlefield? You know, so what's going on here? So, so what's the context? A lot of people don't see the context. They're just looking at words. So, so who are the people who can help us understand the context and help us interpret it the way that it's, has been interpreted for many years and how it needs to be reinterpreted. And so when we talk about scripture and here are the words, and this is the meaning, there's no other way, there's no other way. This Indian culture has never worked like that. Hmm. So Hinduism has been reinvented so many times. In fact, every day, every morning, the Brahmin gets, gets up and his wife cleans everything wonderfully. And sets everything up. So the wife actually does all the work, by the way. And then he does a homa, uh, Agnihotra. And the whole idea is to reinvent the cosmos. When you start again this day, you have another chance to do it right. So your, your first thing of the day is to reinvent the cosmos. Salute the sun and, you know, start again. And this is, so you're starting again. So the whole culture is like that. So Hinduism bumps into Buddhism and Jainism and all kinds of things. And it goes, so what's your thing? Because of this concept of vada, of people coming together who are intelligent and sit down and discuss intelligent things. So it doesn't matter what your religion, what your culture, what do you think of suffering? And some Buddhist comes out and says, suffering? Oh, that's big, that's big, big, big. Our whole thing is about suffering. You know, you have to avoid suffering. So, okay, I'm with you. Because I suffer, I don't like it. I'm with you. Let's, let's discuss suffering. And then Hinduism will transform itself, or some aspects of Hinduism will transform themselves. So Hinduism has been doing this all the time, continues to do it. It's a very dynamic process. So why is the world's oldest religion that is basically incomprehensible to most people, how has it survived? Because it's always reinventing, always interpreting. There are as many Hindus as there are people who call themselves Hindu, because everyone is looking at it from, as a different darshan, a different vision. 
we're looking at it from a different perspective. So interpretation isn't an issue for most Indian religions, mm. this kind of extremism. When it bumps into nationalism, you're beginning to see you have to start to have problems. Because nationalism and Hinduism are it's like an oxymoron. Hindu nationalism doesn't make any sense at all. A basic of Hinduism is that you're the spirit within the body and you're not the body. The body is Indian, and the spirit isn't. So where does nationalism play here? You know, it's it's very difficult to philosophically construct nationalism. And nationalism is a Western idea from the 1700s, developed in Germany by Herder and all that kind of stuff. It kind of doesn't work, and everyone's beginning to realize it. It just has caused a lot of problems, and it's time to get away from it. And, you know, in India, off we go. <laughs> let's, let's start. Let's, let's take it seriously. So there, and again, that has to be discussed intellectually. We have to discuss it dispassionately. And it's very difficult to discuss it now. Once nationalism takes hold, it once becomes political. So what is Hinduism? That's the first question. And then you go to other religions and you see they're struggling with this. This is why they have a difficulty with pluralism. But if they meet other traditions that are pluralistic, we can make a real offering to the world to, to discuss with them how pluralism can work in their tradition. Don't become a Hindu. Become a Christian pluralist, a Jewish pluralist, you know, etc. So let's come on to that about, uh, you know, this point about interfaith. I know you've done a lot of work in, in the kind of interfaith field. Um, and you'd mentioned, so you, you spoke about how, um, you know, one approach is pluralistic and, and could be based on dialogue and, and another may not be. And what do you think it is within different religions that direct them in, in across these two different ways? Like, because if, if not everybody is approaching it from a pluralistic perspective, mm. um, and and I, and I think it's fair to say, even within Hinduism, it's like every Hindu yeah, yeah. is pluralistic. I mean, you know, there's, so what, 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 what would you put it down to in, in your experience? Um, well, in the, in a few places, actually in Indian texts, and one, one in the Bhagavad Purana, it talks about um, different stages of development of faith. And it's the three, three different stages of development of faith. The Kanishta stage is the beginning stage. So someone, starts to think about something other than themselves. There might be something out there. Not quite sure what it is. Some energy of goodness, whatever. You know. And then they bump into other people who are thinking like that and they have a transformative experience. And they it's it's a big thing for them. So they feel, wow, everyone has to have this experience. So they run out and grab the nearest person and say, you have to have this experience. Of course, unfortunately that person isn't looking for that experience. They're looking for a pint of Guinness. And so it's a bit of a clash of interest and all that. But when you're starting out, you don't really have a clue. You haven't read the scripture. You don't know the text. You don't know what you're talking about. But you just have this faith. But there's this weak faith. You have to convince everybody else because otherwise, if they don't do it, then it looks bad for you and you know it starts to become a thing. And then you're standing in front of your deity in your temple, church, mosque, wherever you are, and you're praying and you're looking at the person beside you and you say, yeah, he's praying, but I know him. He's into the race horses and he drinks alcohol. And you know, it's you're at that level of it's not very it's not very advanced. Uh, but there, there are seven Protestant churches on the Lisburn Road in Belfast, and each of them think they have the truth. None of them cooperate with each other. They're not only the same religion, but the same denomination, and they don't talk to each other. So that's how bad it can get. So someone in one temple in the Hindu context may not be talking to people in another temple because we worship Shiva and you worship Vishnu and this and all that. So a Madhyam is someone who's more developed. They've read the scriptures. They've associated with other saintly people and they, and they start to get the bigger picture and they understand it's about relationships. It's about my relationship with God, my relationship with other people who are interested in God, my relationship with people who don't have a clue, maybe not interested or not quite with the program. And people who just hate the idea of God altogether, just, you know, not with. So they associate with people who are interested in God. But interestingly, a person could be a Madhyam in a Hindu temple, but everyone else is a Kanishta. And that's a bit off-putting. So you're standing there with all these people who are kind of fanatical, because uh, that's their motives. And uh, you're bored with that. It's just really not inspiring. 
So you bump into a Christian on a bus and you start talking to him and you realize that he's having the same problem with his community, but the two of you get on well together. And that's Madhyam. It's, it's just a higher level. And you realize he's a devotee of God. His, his interest in life is to know, love, and serve God. That's my interest in life. And all of a sudden you can communicate. He's not even a Hindu. That's not the point. That's the whole, so interreligious dialogue is about people meeting people, not institutions meeting institutions. That's a fallacy. That's for Kanishtas. And a lot of dialogue is that, where it's an official representative thing. There's an MP. It's kind of shaky handy, kissy baby interface dialogue. And, you know, you're up there doing, doing your thing and um, our religion says peace. And then another person comes up and says, our religion says peace. Another person comes up, our religion says peace. Yeah. And then a, a, a uh, MP comes up and says, it's very good, isn't it? Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> and everyone's very tolerant and goes home. But that's not tolerance. That's so skin deep because there's no relationship there. Yeah. So if you can have a relationship with someone and talk about the issues of life, of God, of surrender to God, of love of God, of suffering, of how to deal with someone when they're dying. Someone asks you to go and counsel them when, you're, when they're dying and you're, you want advice. So you go to your friend who knows about spiritual things and it's not the guy in your temple, it's the guy in the church because it's a, it's a more mature conversation. So that, that is significant and very essential in society. And that goes on all the time. I mean, interreligious dialogue goes all the time when you get a plumber to your house and he's a, he's a Quaker or he's a Jew. You know, you know it's like we, we do interreligious dialogue and it's been going on for centuries, trading, going back and forth, true trading. Their, uh, Buddhist monks ended up in Greece in Plato's Symposium. You know, so there were all just in all kinds of trade in religious and philosophical ideas. And, you know, was it an Indian idea first or a Greek idea first or an Egyptian idea first? Well, we, actually, we don't know anymore. <laughs> I haven't got a clue. So there was, there's always been this back and forth, and it's always been healthy. So, so, so there's the individual, as you put it, um, kind of levels of faith within the individual, which kind of then inform how they're going to interact with somebody else of a different faith in terms of, you know, what they're looking for. Mm. And, and <clears throat> earlier, you, were you, when you were speaking about um, within Hinduism, as an example, or within India um, and the pluralism that exists there, do you think that there are particular elements um, of faith itself which um, exist differently in different traditions that incline them more or less towards pluralism? Um, the, the difference in India, and, and we are talking theoretically, you made a very good point that, you know, it's not that you go to India. When I first went to India, I thought everyone was like pure and perfect. <laughs> and they were all followed. These scriptures that I was reading, they were all actually following them and understanding them. And I would go and everyone on the street corners would be chanting bhajans and everyone would walk around in so, uh, saris and dhotis and all that stuff. And all the men were walking around in the 1970s, big shirts and flared jeans. It was like, oh. You know, so, so it is, we, we have to understand that. So everyone on the planet needs education in this, there's no doubt. But uh, Indian religions, theologies, ideas of God develop out of philosophy. So they develop out of Sankhya philosophy, out of Vedanta philosophy. So, but in the West, the theologies don't have a philosophical basis. Uh, Judaism has never seen a need for one, and that's fine. Uh, Christianity needs one and has borrowed Greek philosophy. For his first thousand years, it was Plato. For the next thousand years, it's been Aristotle. Um, Aristotle's very doubtful if he was a theist at all. So it's, it's very clunky. And, um, and Islam was very philosophical, has the potential for philosophy, but doesn't have an intrinsic philosophy. Again, would have to borrow, but had borrowed and engaged but has lost that uh, tradition. So, uh, and having said that, there are many brilliant intellectual Muslims I know who are absolutely excellent. So you can see the potential is there. But with these traditions, at a certain point of development, someone can come in and say, does it say it in the book? And the person says, well, no, it doesn't say it in the book. Then we have to stop talking about it. And it's just, it's shut down. So the whole schools have been shut down. and So, so that's difficult. In India, it started from thinking, and then by thinking it through, then people come to the conclusion of God and start thinking it through further. So the Nasadiya Sukta, you're aware of the Nasadiya Sukta and the Rig Veda? Everyone's read the Rig Veda, I presume. I've, uh, 
So the Rig Veda is the oldest book of Hindu philosophy, the oldest book of philosophy known to man. And the Nasadiya Sukta is one of the prayers in there. And it's, it's wonderful. Try it, look it up and read it. And it's a, it's a, it's a speculative um, prayer and it's kind of considering. So it, it goes on and then in, towards the end it says, so who knows what's real? You're looking for Sat. What is real? So who knows what's real? Maybe the devas know. But the devas, they were born. So they're not eternal. So maybe, maybe they don't know. And maybe Brahma knows. But no, Brahma also. He was born. Shiva. Shiva certainly knows. But he was born of Brahma. Maybe he knows. And they're talking about Brahman. Maybe the thing that we can't describe, the energy that we know is there but can't get into, maybe he knows. And then the last line is, or maybe he does not. You're kind of going, what? <laughs> this is a story? <laughs> but this is an interestingly, intellectually um, uh, profound text. It has intellectual integrity because it's leading you to the point of understanding how little you know. Yet you have no idea. And your first realization has to be, I have no idea what's going on. Otherwise, you can't learn. There's no inquiry. This is the beginning of, the, of discourse. This is the beginning of thinking. So this, this agnosticism, this admitting you don't know, isn't the end to say, oh, I'm an agnostic. And then you just live with that for the rest of your life. That's really lazy intellectualism. No, that's the beginning of learning. That's, that's where you realize, gosh, I'm ignorant. I should know. I should find out. But I, okay, how can I find out? That's, that's the game. So, so that's the basis of Indian intellectual thinking. It has tremendous integrity. The basis is uh, agnosticism is a respectable position because otherwise you're, intellectually you're going nowhere. And then you develop, and then people start to look into all kinds of things. And on that basis, Indians have felt free to investigate every corner, every aspect, every tradition. Go up and ask everyone wearing saffron, what religion are you? And you know, you're Gujarati, so you don't know Tamil. So, and he says, my name is Akila Loka Shasabalai Vishnu Das. I said, <laughs> don't get it. And, and what's your philosophy? And he said, uh, Shuddha Dwet. Sorry. You know, so you ask, what do you do? And then you, you can learn everything about him. And he says, I get up at four in the afternoon, I have a cigarette and a pint of beer. <laughs> and then I go clubbing at 10 o'clock, I go to bed at four in the morning. And then you realize he's an idiot. <laughs> so that's not sad, no? And then you meet some Christian and he says, what do you do? And he says, I'm a Cistercian monk. I get up at three o'clock. I pray for two hours. I said, what do you pray for? Well, I don't pray for anything. I just pray to, to praise God. And uh, I'm a vegetarian and I spend my day serving God and serving the community. And you go, nice one. Mm. That's, that's good sadhana. You know, and it's not about the designation. It's not about, it's just about what the person does. It's their sadhana. That's what you're looking at, not their beliefs. They're not important. And that's what interfaith dialogue is about. It's about people of faith, strong faith, meeting people of strong faith. Then you can really learn something and work, learn how to work together and learn how to influence other people of your faith to think more broadly. Yeah, I, I, I really like that point. I think that's a, that's a really valuable contribution to... Um, to the discussion around interfaith and on what it should focus on, on your, your point around sadhana or practice and, and behavior as opposed to purely belief. I think that's a, that's a great one. I mean, your point on agnosticism, just one thing I wanted to mention. One of the things that really surprised me, actually, when I first read um, the Bhagavad Gita uh, was when Krishna, very early on in the Gita, he says to Arjun, something along the lines, I'm paraphrasing, but you know, even if you don't believe the soul is eternal, then X, Y, Z. And I thought, you know, here's God in a religious text saying, uh, acknowledging the belief of somebody who doesn't believe in an eternal soul. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he's not. And, and, and some of the questions that, and to, to kind of counter some of the questions I guess I was asking earlier, some of the questions that Arjun asked Krishna in the Gita, they seemed a little impertinent. I mean, they, you know, in terms of how he's speaking to Krishna, like that wasn't so clear, you know, what do you mean by this? Why are you contradicting yourself? These types of questions. And, and that, that, that form of dialogue where there is um, freedom of expression in, in one's doubts and uh, clarification from, 
from the other, I think is, you know, to your point around the nature of what that dialogue needs to look like, if it's going to get us beyond sectarian oh, yes. fundamentalism. Yeah. Um, no, and it's a real conversation. Yeah. It's a conversation between friends, although Krishna takes the position of guru, yeah. but, but it's a conversation between friends. And Arjuna is in an emotional state. Mm. He's very upset. Mm. And Krishna has challenged him. So he has taken the subservient position. He has asked for help, but he's, he's a Kshatri. He's not going to give up easily. Mm. You know, so, so Krishna not, not only says what you uh, mentioned, but, but he, he explains all about the soul, and he sees that Arjuna isn't getting it. So then he says, but, you know, if you don't fight, you realize people are going to laugh at you, right? Yeah. That's totally materialistic. Yeah. <laughs> it's a completely yeah, yeah, yeah. ridiculous argument. Yeah. But it's an argument. It's a yeah, real yeah. argument. So he, he lays out all his choices. Yeah. And it, so at the beginning, Arjuna is saying, uh, Govinda, I will not fight. I prefer to live by begging. So he's, it's an allusion to uh, renunciation. So he'll give up in a Kshatriya. He'll go off and be a sadhu. Live by begging meant just be a sadhu, go around and live by begging. And, uh, and then at the end of the sixth chapter, our, uh, Krishna said, so here's an option. So you sit down on a deer skin and uh, you close your eyes and you stare at the tip of your nose. You know why the tip of your nose? Because your half, your half, your eyes are half open, half closed. So you're not asleep, but you can't really see what's going on. So that's, that's interesting. So Arjuna listens to it. And Arjuna at the end of it goes, I can't do that. It's ridiculous. I'm just trying to control my mind. I'm a Shatri, for God's sake, which is exactly what Krishna wanted him to. So he came to the conclusion himself. So first he was saying, I'll go off and be a, a sadhu. And I'll beg for my living. I can't do this. And then he said, I can't be a sadhu. What are you suggesting? <laughs> it was his yeah. suggestion. But Krishna just very intelligently brought him around. And that's, that's a very intelligent conversation, very compassionate friend who does it so gently and with such a light touch that Arjuna convinces himself the whole way along. So his questions, and, and in, more interestingly, in terms of a dialogue, there are eight times in the Gita where Krishna says, this is my opinion. Yeah, exactly. Hang on a minute. He's God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He doesn't have to say my, my opinion. He says, Arjuna, at the start of the Gita is, Arjuna, you're an idiot. Here's what you have to do. X, Y, and Z, do it now. Do it now. Have you done it yet? You know, that's all he has to do. He's God. Um, it's, it's 10 past seven. Um, and we, we've spoken a bit on this just to kind of, I know we could, we could definitely keep going. Um, but um, we wanted to make sure we've got enough time for all of you to ask any questions that you'd like to ask. So at this point, uh, we do have a roaming mic. Um, before we uh, ask for hands, is there anything, Shonaka, that you would like to say before we open up to questions? No, no. We're good to go? Good. Okay.